Years ago, I was given a first edition of Leon Sermelian's classic, I Ask You Ladies and Gentlemen. The first thing that drew my attention was a handwritten note inscribed on the flyleaf by the previous owner. I quote, a most interesting and almost certainly true story of an Armenian boy from Trabizon, who, after losing both his parents in the 1915 deportations and massacres, eventually ended up in the USA. I was soon drawn into the personal journey of a nine-year-old boy, a heartwarming autobiographical account presented in beautiful prose. I learned that the out-of-print book, first published in 1945 and a bestseller in its time, was internationally acclaimed and translated into many languages. In working with the Armenian Institute, we decided to bring back into publication this long forgotten masterpiece for the benefit of new generations. A small team was assembled and the strategy was twofold, to remain utterly faithful to the author's original text, while at the same time to provide the all important historical context, including relevant images, maps, and a glossary of terms. Some historical context now. The book takes place in Trabizon. Trabizon was an important Ottoman port city on the Black Sea. Like many port cities, its population comprised of a mosaic of peoples of different cultures, ethnicities, and religions. When Leon Sermelian was a child, the 19th century had recently passed into history, and the once great Ottoman Empire was undergoing a long, severe decline, with the loss of possessions and facing a host of political, economic, and social change. The Sermelians were a middle-class, urban, extended family headed by an entrepreneurial patriarch. They were well integrated into the fabric of a multicultural Trabizon society. Of financially comfortable means, education for both men and women was valued and emphasized. So why is this book so special and why have we republished it? Sir Melian's book is perhaps the most beautifully and lucidly rendered of the various autobiographies that narrate the experience of the Armenian genocide and its after effects. Among the many inspirations that guided us throughout the republication was the author's own description of his work. I quote, I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, is strictly a factual story, the literal truth about my boyhood. I should like to see it publicized as the universal story, the timeless legend of boyhood. To regard it in any other light is to miss its point and significance. As a timeless story of millions of refugee children around the world, the work is as relevant today as when it was published. For me as a historian, I ask you ladies and gentlemen, is fascinating because we get the perspective of a child, uh, more accurately a boy, on the genocide. Through Somalian, we gain insight into a way that a young boy could steer his own fate and wield agency during the genocide. He manages to get himself taken in by a brigand at a slave market uh, and then finds a new, more conducive uh, merchant to take him in. Uh, when, when he doesn't like the first one. He then runs away and he dodges those who want to, to kill him uh, on the road. He manages to find his way into a Greek village where he then stays with a Greek family as a Greek boy uh, that he knew before the genocide. So this is a really richly layered tale of escapes, of seized chances and of shifting identities that he assumes and then discards at the drop of a hat. There's a lot of walking and running and also scarpering, uh, and we see Somalian, uh, who's only an eight or nine year old boy, steering his own fate as best he could in the circumstances, uh, as he continued to do then for the rest of his life. And for the historian, that's what's interesting, him steering his own fate. What's different about Somalian's memoir? There are many published memoirs and some autobiographies written by Armenians about the period just before, during, and immediately after the genocide. Most focus on the experiences of the genocide itself, how the person survived and was helped to survive. Some, like the village of Parchanch, are highly detailed with maps of the villages showing individual houses, drawings of tools used, and lists of families. Others are more personal and lively, incorporating experiences and relationships. 
In these, we learn about cockfights, blood feuds, descriptions of feasts long past, how and when to harvest, and we get a glimpse of a very wide variety of daily life during that period, not just the elite, not just the church leaders or the traders. The excellent series by the Zorian Institute, Survivor's Memoirs, also includes the unusual narrative of Bertha Nakashian Ketchian in the shadow of the fortress, the genocide remembered. This story tells us about the lives of those who secretly stayed behind in the villages around Kharpert, how they hid, how they found food, and how some of their wealthier compatriots lived in full view during that same period in their own beautiful homes. The memoirs of non-Armenians such as Henry Riggs or Stanley Carr who lived through this period also help us to learn more about the daily life that preceded the genocide, the attitudes, ideas that animated people, and how they struggled to cope with the destruction of their society. We know that writing about traumatic, exciting, shocking events often comes alive on the page. While the recounting of later life reflects the more routine, sedentary, normalized existence that has replaced the adventure of survival, there are exceptions, of course, such as George Mardikian's Song of America or Marjorie Hosepian Dobkin's A House Full of Love. Leon Sermelian stands out as an artist in his writing. His tales are not fiction, however. Today we see other children taking risks and making journeys that we believe to be impossible, but which they see as very simply crucial to their survival. Remnants of traditional ways of life stay with them, but some extraordinary new ways of coping and living are invented in the many moments of necessity. As Sermelian demonstrates, and as mentioned already, there is much evidence of individual agency where people are able to make choices, however limited in scope. And I don't mean to insinuate that only those who are somehow more intelligent, more resourceful, outwitted their captors, but that the, for the very fortunate, there were moments when a particular response or action could bring a respite or even a change of fate. Sermelian's memoir maintains its energy and questing spirit in scenes that follow his physical survival. His descriptions of life post-genocide in Kansas are equally packed with emotion and consequence. Many memoirs at this point go on to list the achievements of the writer in the new country writing in a suddenly plodding fashion about where they worked, and so on. Sermelian leaves this out and switches to a philosophical discussion with whoever will take part, his readers, himself, his absent friends and family. It must be significant that at this point, just before publication of I Ask You Ladies and Gentlemen, Sermelian changed his name to Leon from Zaven, honoring his uncle, who was his childhood hero. The following is taken from chapter 24 of I Ask You Ladies and Gentlemen, and it gives you an idea of this kind of conversation. But I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, what can I do? When once upon a time the world was no larger than the little side street where I was born, where I led my armies to incredible victories on my spirited broomstick horse, when stalwart men in hobnailed shoes sold vegetables, carrying primitive weighing instruments with pebbles of various sizes for weights, and sang the praises of their string beans and eggplants and tomatoes and artichokes in booming, hearty voices, and beautiful village women wearing costumes like Byzantine frescoes cried, Chinogala, as they came to the city to sell milk and yogurt carrying on their backs baskets loaded with clay pitchers and jars of classic forms. I ask you, what can you do on New Year's Eve in free and happy America when your playmates and schoolmates, the kids you grew up with, your companions in grief and joy, in hunger and misery, fellow dreamers during your dream age, are gone, lost? I must forget my past the New Year's of long ago. I'm an American citizen, sincerely attached to the Constitution, and I'll fight for America any time. But I ask you, how can a guy forget his childhood? 
There are millions like me tonight in free, happy America, haunted by their early years, which are always, everywhere, the happiest. The world is full of sorrow and memories, of stories that cannot be told, of poignant images that have no stories. Forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, I must have another drink. In the chapter entitled The Great Hoax, Surmelian describes his debut as a poet when he was a student at the Central Lycée in Constantinople. Despite this disparaging title, his first poems caused an excitement because Hagop Oshagan, this fastidious titan of Armenian literary criticism, introduced him to Vahan Tekeyan, arguably the most famous living West Armenian poet then. However, I think the seeds of Surmelian's poetry were sown in scenes described in an earlier chapter, Dream's End, in which he lay awake for hours in a hovel and lived through epic scenes from the Armenian history. The only volume of Surmelian's Armenian poems, written when he was aged 16 to 18, was edited and published in 1924 by Tekeyan, who was full of praise for these 21 poems, emphasizing the beauty of their depth and form. This slim volume gives a foretaste of Sumelian's worldview, literary passions, and aesthetic orientations. Some poems, the strongest in my view, are crystallized manifestations of Surmelian's emotional state. Others appear to be infused with the breath of Misak Mezarens and Tekeyan himself. This small collection of poems, indeed just one of them, a poem entitled Thoughts on Planting a Tree, is enough to secure a permanent place for the author in the world of Armenian lyric poetry. I'm going to illustrate this point by reading the first stanza of uh, the poem, first in Armenian and then its English translation. Asatsvatsk tsar dengelu artiv. Der orne tsar nais madrash. Yeske dengem zainaha pochrun yev sev horin mech ul baberes kebargin. Yes, anons tore huska. I saw him there named Gergin, Warevunta Gajim Anunident Shurtisvara. Thoughts on planting a tree. Lord, bless this sapling. Look, I'm planting it in the crumbly and black soil where my ancestors lie. I, their hulking descendant, possess this land again and grow and flourish under the sun with their names on my lips. After his arrival in the United States, Surmelian cut all ties with muses of poetry and devoted his literary talent to prose. He left poetry, but poetry didn't leave him. In the words of William Saroyan, the book I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, is almost a lyric poem. 